first ever introduction to video games was the Commodore 8-bit Micros. Back in 1985, my home computer was a Commodore 64 with a tape drive. The tape drive known as a dataset was something that I owned as a much cheaper option than the 1541 disk drive, which actually cost as much as the machine itself. This is the C2N dataset for the Commodore line of machines. It worked with the Commodore PET, VIC-20, C64, C16 and Plus 4, and the Commodore 128. While there were different models, all of them performed the same task, to read in data from conventional cassette tapes into the Commodore's memory. Magnetic tape storage like this was certainly not invented by Commodore. In fact, many 8-bit micros of the era use magnetic tape storage as it was an inexpensive storage option. In the UK, software houses would sell games on cassette. If you were lucky enough or lived in North America, the chances are you would own a 1541 disk drive instead. According to Computer Game World magazine in 1986, 97% of Commodore systems in the USA own disk drives. Cassette players like the C2N were popular in Europe and Australia, with most game sales on cassette and considered the standard format of the era. So how do you actually load games from cassette? Well, simply turn on the C64, put the game into the dataset, make sure you rewind back to the start. A good hint is also to set the tape counter to 000. This is important because you're not really quite sure how long the game may take to load, and a tape counter will be your guide. On the C64, simply type load and press enter, or hold shift and press run stop. From here, follow the on-screen prompts to press play on tape. And at this point, the game should go through its loading process. And it will take some time, and I do mean some time. We're talking about between five to 10 minutes, depending on the game. This is because loading games from tape is extremely slow. But there are some tricks that developers used to speed up the process. Now, software houses knew that playing games on cassette was tedious. And what they would offer on occasion is loading graphics. So there was a nice image to, to look at while the game was loading. But even better than that was C64 audio or SID music playing through the SID chip as the game loaded. There was also these horizontal bars that flashed around the border, known as loading bars. This was performed all while the game was loading. These are visual and audio clues to let the user know that the game is loading and to continue waiting. Take for example Rambo First Blood Part 2 by Ocean Software. As the game loads, you can see that the loading graphics are being drawn pretty slowly. But what happens if we stop the tape? You can see that the graphics stop as well. This is a cue to let the user know that there is a problem with the cassette and it's a good idea to start over. Tape plays like this were certainly not exclusive to Commodore. In fact, other 8-bit micros of the era supported magnetic tape storage. The C2N, however, was different because of its digital format. Now you may be asking, how is a tape player digital? Well, to explain further, on a computer such as the ZX Spectrum, just about any portable tape player could be used as long as there was an analog earphone or line-out jack that could be plugged directly into the computer. The C2N uses a proprietary edge connector that plugs into the tape expansion port of the Commodore 64. What this means is it's not possible to use any standard regular tape recorder for the C64. There is, however, aftermarket adapters that you can purchase to do just this. But this was certainly not something that was available back in the 80s. The advantage of a digital format like this is that it supports error correction, but subsequently a disadvantage is that the Commodore dataset is slower than conventional analog tape systems. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's first talk about exactly how a Commodore C64 even knows what to do with data found on cassette. To start, have you ever wondered what a C64 game sounds like on a standard tape player? Well, this is 2022 and I don't own a tape player anymore. So let's cheat a little and open up a C64 tape WAV file in Windows. Here's a listen. Now this may have some familiarity to you if you're used to the sounds of a dial-up modem in the late 90s and early 2000s. But if we zoom in closer on the data, you'll note that it's comprised of many different square wave patterns 
These square waves are different lengths and that accounts for the differences in sounds. These differences in sounds also determine if the binary data is a one or a zero. When play is pressed on the tape drive, the C64 is waiting for data. When these square waves are fed to the C64, there are a maximum of three different square wave patterns that are encoded on C64 tape. These are long, medium, and short. To determine if a one or a zero is the next value, the C64 senses when the waveform moves from a greater than zero value to a lesser than zero value. This event is called a pulse and causes an interrupt request to be delivered to the CIA chip on the C64. Each byte of data is identified by a long square wave, like this one here. And then a one bit is identified by a medium square wave followed by a small square wave, like this one here. And a zero bit is identified by a small square wave followed by a medium square wave. Now the other interesting thing about the Commodore 64 data set was it had its own error correcting. And the way that it would do this was effectively have two copies of the same data on cassette. If I enter this basic program and save it to cassette, what's happening is it's saving two separate copies of the data one after the other. So in the instance, if an error occurs during loading the first time round, the C64 remembers where the previous error occurred and retries with the second copy of the data off the tape. In general, Commodore's tape format is reliable because of its built-in error correction and detection but this has the side effect of being slower than the analog tape drives of its competition. However, tape speeds can be significantly sped up by using what's known as a turbo or fast loader. This can cut down a 15 minute data load to as little as five minutes. Essentially, turbo loaders work by identifying a one or a zero as a single square wave instead of pulses of two or more. This compresses down the bits of data, but because the standard tape loader on the C64 won't be able to interpret this, during the initial load of the game from tape, the first thing that it must do is put the turbo loader program resident in memory. Then the program will load the turbo or fast load data. Almost every C64 game I've played used a turbo loader, and there were many different ones on the market to load games from tape. On average, a normal load time is about four to six minutes. Developers got creative and did what they could to make that wait to load games more bearable, and sometimes they went that extra mile. In 1987, a fast loader was developed known as Invader Load. This was developed by Richard Applin, an experienced C64 and Amiga developer at the time. It contained a mini Space Invaders game that only required eight kilobytes of data. Four kilobytes was for the absolutely amazing Rob Hubbard soundtrack. This is a Space Invaders mini game and one that's completely playable as the main game is loading from cassette. This was all done many, many years before Namco's patent to prevent other companies from having playable mini games as loading screens. Namco may have patented the concept, but they were certainly not the first. Although tape was a suitable format, there were many games that were great on floppy disk that did not translate well. Specifically ones that required multiple loads as you progress through the game would often require the user to either manually fast forward, rewind, or turn the cassette over to side B to load the next portion of the game. Multi-load cassette games really broke up the fun and the immersion of the gameplay as you'd need to wait at least another two to five minutes for the next level to load. Worse, if you died, you would need to rewind the tape back to where level one was stored and reload it. This of course all worked, but it was a bit tedious. Thankfully, some games once again had brilliant loading graphics and music, such as The Last Ninja by System 3. Now, of course, publishers were very concerned about software piracy when it came to cassette. It was very easy just to acquire a boombox that had two tape decks and you could simply make a copy of the source cassette. Now, tape copy protection was actually something that was looked into and incorporated with some levels of success. Tape copy protection was implemented mainly to stop freezer cartridges such as the Action Replay to work. These could be easily detected via the cartridge port. However, straight duplication of tapes was the biggest concern as the average person could simply do it if they had a decent enough tape deck. However, the results were often inconsistent. Most of the time, a simple tape duplication wouldn't work or would error out. This is because a copy of a cassette on a consumer level hi-fi would often introduce tape hiss and noise. 
This meant that the square wave patterns that the C64 is looking for would be inconsistent as compared to the original master. On top of this, other tricks were used to master the tape with a weak signal, but still enough for the data set to read in the data. This meant that the tape noise would be audible enough to result in errors. And finally, most hi-fi tape decks record in stereo, but the data set expects data in mono. This causes issues as most stereo tape deck heads read mono data on the edges of the tape, whereas the data set reads from the center of the magnetic data for that side. As we mentioned, the C2N has error correction. However, with the much more compressed fast load data that we talked about earlier, it meant that it was easier for tape duplication to fail. But with that all said, with the right cassette tape, a good tape deck with noise reduction, and the right levels of EQ, you could pretty much copy any game on the market. And this was a major concern for software houses in the UK at the time, with illegal bootlegging of games being resold on the used market. This would go away when the world moved to compact discs in the late 90s. Just kidding, they got cracked as well. But of course, I have a lot of love and nostalgia for the C64. It is the first system that I ever used, and the data set was a necessary evil by Commodore. It was crude, but it got the job done, and look, it really promoted the Commodore brand in many different countries around the world, and that's one of the reasons why I think it was the most successful home computer for such a long time. But we are going to leave it here for this episode. Thank you so much for watching, guys. If you liked it, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.